Our scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, the first chapter, verses 16 through 20. Will you stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel? As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew. They were fishermen, so they were throwing fishing nets into the sea. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and followed him. After going a little further, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment, he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So during the month of January, one of the things that we have been doing is something we're referring to as a spiritual wellness th- survey. About 350 of these have already been done, uh, either in paper or online. We're not going to pass them out this morning because we're going to make the assumption that most of us have probably done this. But if for some reason you have not done one of these spiritual wellness surveys, I'm going to invite you to pick one up today. They're on the round table And you can just fill it out this morning or uh, take it with you and bring it back. Uh, Or you can go online and do this. Maybe the easiest way to do this. Our our idea here is, is that we all know we're making resolutions. Maybe resolutions about our physical health or our emotional health or financial health. We ought to be making some resolutions about our spiritual well-being as well. And so part of what we want you to do is fill that out. We hope this will be a resource for us where we can then turn around and begin to make sure that if there are ways in which we can resource you uh, in your own spiritual well-being, that the church is able to do that. So I hope that you'll do that uh, today if you have not already done that. We want to wrap this up in the next week or so, and then we're going to share the results uh, of these surveys as well. Well, of course, resolution always needs action in order to come to fruition, right? You just, if, it doesn't help just to make a resolution and then not do anything about it. And that's one of the reasons we're also then this month uh, studying the gospel of Mark. And we're doing this series entitled A Call to Action. The gospel of Mark is the gospel of action. There are no long speeches in Mark. There's just a lot of watching Jesus and seeing Jesus move and move other people to action. And it's a, it's a great gospel. I want to invite you, if you haven't already done so, to start reading the gospel of Mark during January. You'll be amazed at how fast-paced it is. If you've never read the Bible before, the gospel of Mark is a great place to start. And if you have read the Bible often... It's a great place to go back to at the beginning of a brand new year. Last week we started at the waters of baptism and talked about how important it is that God troubles the waters of our lives and how we're invited into this deeper relationship with him. Today we come uh, to this next place where Jesus is calling his first disciples. And in Mark's gospel we get them by name, Simon and Andrew, James and John. So we're going to look at their story today. And as always, as we kind of move into their story, we're going to look for our own story as well. Let's begin our time with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, inspire us with your true and lively word that we may know more of what it means to be your children, that we may faithfully respond to the call of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one in whose name we've gathered and the one in whose name we pray. Amen. What is it in your life that you do immediately? What is it in your life that you do immediately? You know, I kind of have a sense that in the world we live in today, because we desire more control and we have so many tools of technology, there are some things we don't do with a sense of urgency like we used to. Now, my hunch is, though, that when, when, when a, an emergency arises, we do some things immediately. If we experience an emergency, we'll call 911, right? A couple of weeks ago, we had this very thing happen on a Tuesday morning. It was the first day that our preschool children were back at school. 
And we were uh, in a meeting. It was a cold morning, really the first morning. It had gotten down into the 20s. And uh, uh, we were in a meeting at about 930. And all of a sudden, the fire alarms in the church went off. Well, immediately, we got up. And immediately, we went downstairs to make sure the children were getting evacuated. And immediately, we evacuated the children according to our plan. And then immediately we went outside to greet the fire department. And then immediately we tried to find out where the fire was in the building. We came to find out there was not a fire in the building, but instead there was a pipe in Tom Graves Hall connected to our fire sprinkler system. And it had burst because of the cold weather. So immediately we shut the water off. But water had already started seeping into the room. And so immediately, staff people started taking off their shoes and their socks. And they started moving furniture and chairs and things and tables out of Tom Graves Hall so that it wouldn't get damaged by the water. We started sweeping water out the door. It was just one of those moments where you had to have a sense of urgency about what was going on. It made me think, there are some things we don't do immediately anymore. You know, I used to answer the phone immediately when it rang. I don't do that anymore because I have caller ID and I have voicemail and I can look at that and say, well, this is not an emergency. I don't need to deal with that right now. I used to watch television programs immediately. Did you used to do that? I didn't have a VCR. I didn't have a, a DVR where I could tape it. I didn't, I, I didn't have the ability to watch something on demand on my schedule. So when something was scheduled, I would race home immediately and watch it. Because the likelihood was it wasn't going to be in reruns for like another six months, right? Now, I know there are younger people in the room right now that are wagging their head going, what in the world is he talking about? But there are things we used to do more immediately because we didn't have control over those things. What do you do immediately? The word immediately in Greek appears 59 times in the New Testament. And 41 of those occurrences are in the gospel of Mark. Mark is the gospel of the immediate and in this scripture today, we get sort of the, the, this case study about um, the way Mark moves things along. And it's not just the fact that Mark uses the word for immediate several times in this passage. It's the way he describes this passage. It's really interesting. There's almost no dialogue. There's almost no conversation the passage today begins, and we go from having been in the waters of the Jordan, immediately now we're in Galilee. We're in a whole different place. And Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee. Some of our pilgrims from Grace Avenue will be at the Sea of Galilee later on this week. And Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, and immediately he calls out to these two fishermen that he sees, Simon and his brother Andrew. There, there's no introduction. There's no idle chit-chat. There is no exchange of pleasantries. Jesus says, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. And then we're told these fishermen just drop their nets. They, they don't put the nets away. They don't try to take care of some unfinished. Immediately they drop their nets and they follow him. Then we're told Jesus goes on and immediately he comes and finds two more fishermen, James and John, and this time they're with their father and with some hired workers and they're mending their nets. And Jesus once again says, come and follow me. And we're told immediately, immediately, James and John leave their father. They leave behind the hired workers and they follow Jesus. The story is just Stark. It's, it's striking in the way that it's told with this kind of a sense of urgency. And I think it's also a reminder that in Mark's gospel, part of the other sense of urgency is about the kingdom of God. Mark will have Jesus say over and over and over again in Mark's gospel, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is not just some kind of future promise. That's part of it. But that's not at all the whole thing. The kingdom of God is here. It's now. We believe that, right? We prayed it just a few moments ago. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. 
as it is in heaven. And the reality of it is, is that always with the kingdom of God, it's interruptive. In the midst of what seems to be going on, there is this interruption of the kingdom of God that brings with it a sense of urgency. In the darkness of the world, we are interrupted by God's light. In the despair of the world, we are interrupted by God's mercy. In the despondency and in the depression of the world, we are interrupted by God's grace. And in the midst of a world full of conflict, we are interrupted by the coming of the one who is the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. The kingdom of God is always an interruption. And part of that interruption causes us to ask the question, do we respond immediately? When the kingdom of God breaks in once again to our lives, just as we've prayed for, do we respond without hesitation? I think this story today of the calling of the disciples says some very powerful things about the kingdom of God, about the truth of the kingdom of God. I think one of the things it shows us first is that the kingdom of God is not a negotiation. The kingdom of God is not a negotiation. Now, in this story, what's striking about it is, is that there just is no dialogue here. The only person that speaks, we have all these named people. Jesus, Simon, Andrew, James, John, Zebedee, the hired workers. The only one that speaks is Jesus. There's no back and forth. There's no conversation. And, and in some respects, we might look at that and say, well, that, that makes sense. You know, Mark wasn't, a, uh, wasn't there firsthand. He doesn't really know what was said, so he didn't introduce any dialogue. I don't think that's what Mark's about here. I think what Mark is trying to remind us of here is that when the call of God comes, when the kingdom of God breaks in, it is not a negotiation. Do you ever do that with God? God, I really know you want me to do this. I know you really want me involved in this. But right now, I've got all this other stuff going on. God, I really know that you're calling me to this. You're really inviting me to this. But, you know, until I can get all this other stuff sort of fixed up, we'd be okay. You understand? How many of us in our lives right now spend time negotiating with God? When what we're really called to is to follow Jesus. We're called to faith. We're called to trust. There's another place in the Gospels where we do get this uh, kind of moment that goes on. Uh, there's a story that appears both in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel. And in Luke 9, there's this really interesting encounter in which Jesus calls people just like he called the fishermen. Listen to what it says in Luke 9. Then Jesus said to someone, follow me. And the person replied, Lord, first let me bury my father. And Jesus said to them, you remember what Jesus said? Let the dead bury their own dead. You come and spread the good news of God's kingdom. And then another person came to Jesus and said, I will follow you, but first let me go and say goodbye to those in my house. And Jesus said to them, said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. Gosh, I know that sounds harsh. But the reality of it is, is that we're being reminded by Jesus, there's always going to be something that stands as an obstacle to us following Jesus Christ. Always going to be an obstacle. Always going to be something. And the reality of it is, is that we're called to respond with immediacy. The kingdom of God is not a negotiation. One of the places in the world where Christianity is now spreading the fastest is on the continent of Africa. And a lot of people have tried to spend some time thinking about why is Christianity spreading so quickly across the continent of Africa? And some people have come to the conclusion that it's because of this willingness among so many of the people to follow Christ without hesitation. There's a great statement that was written by a Zimbabwe pastor not long ago in which he talks about 
this very idea of following Christ without hesitation. The Zimbabwe pastor says, I am a disciple of Christ. I will not let up. I will not look back. I will not slow down. My past is redeemed. My future is secure. I'm done with low living, small planning, smooth knees, mundane talking, stingy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence or prosperity or position or promotion or popularity. I don't have to be right or first or tops or recognized or praised or rewarded. My face is set. My goal is sure, my God is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought or compromised or detoured or delayed or diluted. I will not flinch in the face of adversity. I will not negotiate at the table of my enemy. And I will not meander in the maze of mediocrity. Why? Because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is not a negotiation. And the question is, when the call comes to our lives, are we willing to follow Jesus without hesitation? But I think the second truth that we find in the scripture today about the kingdom of God is that it reminds us that the kingdom of God reveals to us our true potential. The kingdom of God reveals to us our true potential. The other side of this no dialogue in the story today is also the place of Jesus. Because I'm thinking, wouldn't Jesus want to vet these people out just a little bit? I mean, he didn't come and ask them where they're from or what they've done or if they have a resume. He just comes and just says, follow me. And I'm thinking, why would you blindly invite somebody just to come and follow you? The reality of it is Jesus already knew their potential. And do you know how he knew their potential? It wasn't because they were fishermen. It was because they were children of God. Every person God creates is filled with godly potential. You realize that? Every one of us in this room has godly potential because we are the children of God. We are the people of God. And the question is, what are we doing with that godly potential? It's the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of God breaks in, we begin to realize our godly potential. That's part of what we've been calling the hero's journey. You know, all of us seem to be fascinated these days with heroes and superheroes, whether it's out of things like Star Wars or some of these other movies that are coming out about superheroes right now. And you remember last week we talked about the fact that a hero is really nothing more than an ordinary person who does extraordinary things. And in the gap between the ordinariness of a person... And the extraordinary things that they do in the gap is potential. We all have the potential to live a hero's journey. Another way of saying that is that we're all filled with godly potential. And this is good news. It's the kingdom of God. When, it, when that interruption comes, it helps us sometimes. It pushes us sometimes to see that. I talked a little bit about that last week, about this idea in baptism that God troubles the water. This divine disruption is oftentimes the thing that helps us see our potential, our godly potential. In April of 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King was uh, placed in jail in Birmingham, Alabama. He had been protesting, uh, and in the midst of these nonviolent protests, he was arrested, he was beaten, and he was placed in the Birmingham jail. A couple of days after having been in the jail, there were a group of pastors in Birmingham who wrote a letter to the newspaper. And in this letter to the newspaper, they wrote and, and said in the newspaper letter that, that they really agreed with, with the whole thing that Dr. King was trying to do. They just didn't agree with his methods, that he shouldn't be stirring people up. He shouldn't be agitating people in this way. And as Dr. King read the letter that appeared in the Birmingham newspaper, he started writing on that newspaper because he didn't have anything else to write with. And what he began to write on that newspaper was what we now today know as the letter from the Birmingham jail. 
And as he wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail, one of the things that Dr. King said in the letter was he reminded us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But there was a lot of detail in this letter. And part of it is, is that he wrote specifically to these eight pastors who had written the letter that appeared in the newspaper. One of the things that he said to the eight pastors that the rest of the world got to see was this statement that said, More and more I feel the people of ill will have used their time more effectively than have the people of good will. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. We will have to repent in this generation not merely of the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Now, a lot of people read that and they feel like Dr. King was criticizing those eight pastors. I don't believe that. You know what he was doing? He was saying to those eight pastors and to the people that read the letter and to the people of subsequent generations like us, you have so much more potential inside you than to be silent in the face of injustice. We have so much more potential inside us than to be silent in the face of injustice. And because of that, when the kingdom of God breaks in, we begin to realize our godly our God-given potential. When the kingdom of God breaks in, when the call of Jesus comes, when the moment of injustice arises, do we respond without hesitation? The kingdom of God is not a negotiation. The kingdom of God helps us realize our God-given potential. But then also this morning, I think this scripture reminds us of this great truth that the kingdom of God is for keeps. Jesus does offer a sense of purpose in this story today. It's it's really the one point at which we get a little more detail. Instead of just follow me, immediately they followed. Follow me, immediately they followed. There's that one point at which Jesus gives a little bit more. And he says to the group, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. He gives this powerful, powerful purpose. But what is this purpose about? The purpose is about that every life is important to God. And when we reach out to another life, for the sake of Jesus Christ, it's for keeps. I bet you know that because you're in the church. I bet you know that probably some of the most sacred, ongoing, for life relationships you have have been nurtured through a faith community. The kingdom of God is for keeps. Many of you have read the book, Same Kind of Different as Me. And many of you have seen the motion picture that came out just to uh, a few months ago. It's a, it's a wonderful story about a very unusual friendship between a guy named Ron Hall and another guy by the name of Denver Moore. Ron Hall was this affluent person. He was an art dealer. He had everything in life he could ever want from a prosperity and wealth standpoint. Denver Moore was a, a man who lived in a homeless shelter. And uh, in the midst of a set of circumstances, they get to know one another. And after a few encounters, Ron asked Denver this pretty simple question. And the question basically is, would you like to be my friend? Now, Ron just thought, well, you know, he'll just get, of course, a, a, a standard answer and an a affirmative response. But when Ron Hall asked Denver, would you like to be my friend? You know what Denver said? Denver said, I'm going to have to think about it. You ever had anybody do that with you? Would you like to be my friend? Yeah, I'm going to have to think about that. (laughs) Denver comes back to him later, and in the midst of having a deeper conversation about this, Denver really wants to inquire, and he says, do I understand that when your people go fishing, they practice something called catch and release? And Ron said, well, yeah, yeah, I guess. I know people that do that. 
He said, that just doesn't make any sense to me. He said, when my people go fishing, we catch a fish. If we're going to work that hard to catch a fish, we're going to keep it. In fact, we're going to take it, we're going to show it off to everybody else. And after we've done showing it to everybody else, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to cut it up and we're going to cook it. We're going to eat it and we're going to allow it to nurture our body. He said, it troubles me that your people would go to all of that trouble to catch that fish and then just throw it back into the water. And then Denver went on to say something extremely important. He said, Ron, I guess it's this way. If you're fishing for a new friend and you're just going to catch and release, then I ain't interested in being your friend. But if you're looking for a real friend, then I'll be your friend forever. There is a kind of sacred connection. When Jesus says to Simon and to Andrew and to James and John, Follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. He ain't talking about catch and release. For every child of God is precious to God. And every opportunity that we have to enter into that kind of sacred trust and relationship, those kinds of friendships are forever. Sometimes we forget that when we get caught up in the busyness of our lives and when we see new people come into our church, when we think, oh, I, I've got to take the time to get to know those people. And yet there's somebody that took the time to get to know you. The kingdom of God is for keeps. If you're just fishing and you're going to catch and release... That's not the calling that Jesus has for us today. The kingdom of God is not a negotiation. The kingdom of God reveals our godly potential. And the kingdom of God is for keeps. The echo of that calling is just as real in the room today as it was the day Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee. And immediately he called those disciples... And immediately they responded. And the question that's left for us today is that when Jesus calls once again today, will we respond without hesitation? Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for the call that you put on our lives. Sometimes in a world where we look so much for explanation and we look so much for some kind of negotiation to make it our way. We remember the importance is that it is your way. It is your way that matters. And so today, oh God, we ask that you help us once again to not only hear this call, but to heed this call, to put into action all the potential that you've placed inside of us and to know that when we do, the eternal goodness of the relationships we make will be ours forever. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.